world's best rocket scientist isn't the world's best marine biologist. Just like the world's strongest man probably couldn't nail Swan Lake. Being a specialist means not being great at lots of other things. It takes dedicated focus. But that sort of focus is out of fashion. Today, everyone wants to be a generalist. Not at NetApp. We're proud to be specialists. We don't make laptops. You don't want us to create a TV show? Seriously. We can't do what our customers do. What we do is provide the most cutting edge and remarkable cloud storage services on the planet, which might not make us a great DJ. But it does let us help you access your data in the right place at the right time. There's plenty of things we can't do, but we can connect your cloud to on-prem and have them get along like BFFs. BFFs that reduce costs and improve data availability, obviously. Cooking Michelin star food? Sorry. Analyzing data to maximize your security and maintain compliance? Take a seat. Puppy training? No. Optimizing application performance in data centers and on the cloud? Good boy. It's all we think about. Unlocking more than you ever thought possible from your cloud. So when you're thinking about cloud storage, why just be in good hands? When you can be in the mother flipping specialist's hands. The cloud storage specialists. NetApp. Hello and welcome to the NetApp Amplify series, a virtual space and place where we bring together some of the sharpest minds in tech to deep dive into the industry's biggest challenges. In this session, we'll be talking about digital transformation and more specifically, how to drive resiliency and transformation in your business. From storage and services to the world's most cutting edge cloud solutions, NetApp can simplify your life and amplify your performance. To open up this world, we have two first class speakers to take us through how to drive resiliency and transformation. So let's get started. As a Xennial born with an analog childhood and digital adulthood, Lisa Salud is a serial entrepreneur who has invested her lifetime on the frontiers of deep tech pioneering, digital transformation, and innovation. She has served more than 400 multinationals and a plethora of startups in 19 sectors across Europe, Asia Pacific, and the Americas. With her purpose to make a difference, Lisa has had 15 years of digital director and board advisory experience in the not-for-profit, academic, and private sectors, empowering her boards with best practice corporate reputation strategies, risk management, cyber governance, and acceleration of their digital transformation in market access. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to her. I'd like to welcome to the NetApp Amplify series, Lisa Salud. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lisa Salud, and it's my great pleasure to join you here today at NetApp here in Singapore. I'm joining you today from a smart nation, and it's my great pleasure to take you on a journey of digital transformation. Now, did you know that nearly seven years ago in the mid 1300s, the first major outbreaks of the bubonic plague forced Europeans into some of the harshest social distancing measures in the history of mankind. And as Boccaccio wrote in the Decamoran, 1353, this hysteria was just so extreme that brother abandoned brother, mother abandoned child, as if they had not been their own. And when people sensed that the world was over, they slowly came out of their homes. But there was no grand reopening of the economy, just like a department store under new management. People remained very mistrustful of one another, even avoiding the most basic of interactions with family, friends, and professional colleagues. Now, commerce was slow and the economy remained depressed for years. And just when it seemed that the situation was finally starting to improve, the plague struck again in 1360 and again in 1374. Medieval Europeans quickly realized that if there was just one last rat left on the planet, that in fact it could strike again, and it did. And that made it next to impossible for anything to return to normal. In fact, only a handful of businesses returned to normal. Food and agriculture did well, as can be expected. And in fact, 
Science and technology burgeoned like never before seen in history, and only a handful of other selected industries flourished. Most industries suffered immeasurably. But today our circumstances are obviously different. This world has some of the brightest minds working to eradicate the pandemic, and I am blessed at R3I Ventures to work with many of them, transforming this planet from around the world. And while there are certainly a lot of challenges that we must still deal with, we are still able to produce certain goods, we're able to ship them across the globe, and we were able to have them delivered at our door. But there is no doubt that this global pandemic has shocked us. Already its silent weapon has stolen more than one million of our loved ones from us. And in just a few decades, the same description will fit yet another crisis, and that is that of climate change to mitigate the risk. Well, I'm lucky that I live in Singapore. And like the plague, this pandemic, despite our smart nation, has still left us all afraid to leave our homes, afraid to hug one another, to physically connect, and to engage. But we have never been more connected than ever before. And despite the risks, I'm feeling very safe today. You see, artificial intelligence has my back, and it really is changing our lives here for the better. As I left my house this morning, my contact tracing begged to 470 other phones where I was within the city. It mapped if I came into contact with anyone who was ill, it registered when I entered my building, and it will register exactly when it is that I leave here tonight. In an R3I, we too are scaling breakthrough innovation for impact. And if I'm lucky and I go to lunch, this Boston Dynamics robot spot patrols the park outside my work and tells us when we're not observing safe distancing rules. It's also fitted with smart cameras telling us when more than a number of people are sitting within a gathering. But this concept of digital transformation has been talked about by so many people for so long. And just what really is it? What is the difference between digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation? I'd like you to take three minutes and write that down. And now welcome back. So what is digital? Well, as you know, the term digital is used in many ways these days, but what does it really mean? There are a variety of terms related to this that are noted, such as digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. And are they the same things? Or can we offer you some definitions, as well as a couple of examples, to show you that words really matter? And it's so important to you as a leader who drives or at least will be involved in the decision making for the strategy of digital transformation for you to champion the use of the right terminology. More important, you need to ensure that everyone is on the right page and that you too can truly reap the rewards of digital transformation. So what is digitization? It is this concept of taking analog to digital. Think about that newspaper. Think of it as converting atoms into bits, creating digital opportunities in the process. Think of paper instruction manuals. Converting those from physical paper to a digital format represents digitization. Another example is that newspaper. The New York Times is distributing digitized or digital content through digital channels, its website, thenewyorktimes.com, and through the New York Times app, rather than our physical channels, the printed newspaper. These are such simple examples of digitization. But industries that can be easily digitized are the most disrupted. Financial services, the digitization of money. Newspapers, the digitization of our newspapers. Music, anything that is content related and can be digitized can be heavily disrupted. And digitalization is the use of these digital technologies and digitally enabled approaches to enable or improve business models and processes. Think of this as the processing of exploiting digital opportunities. For example, I might use my smart glasses to provide mechanics with line of sight digital instructions that can improve both efficiencies and reduce errors. Or to take another example from the New York Times, this publication pioneered new business models, such as a paywall, which expanded its payments for digital product offerings. This expanded offering would eventually include videos, podcasts, virtual reality, and more. And it also entailed leveraging digital data and analytics to increase that usability of data and drive subscriptions. 
This represents the digitalization of activities that the media New York Times has undertaken. Now, what is digital transformation? I'd like to encourage you to think of this coordinated digitalization change efforts at scale. Change efforts that are diffused through the operating model and all aspects of business, including people, process, technology, governance, and metrics. And the goal of this is to bring meaningful outcomes to your organization. Integration of various digitization initiatives, such as augmented reality guided instructions, 3D printed tools that have Internet of Things enabled sensors connected with them, that can result in the fundamental transformation of the manufacturing process. This is an example of digital transformation. Or if we continue with the New York Times example, the company has reoriented itself as a digital first organization, having increased digital subscriptions more than a thousand percent over the last 10 years. And the company is on track to hit in revenue by 2021. And by clearly delineating different digital concepts, the New York Times is able to formulate a digital transformation strategy to respond to digitization in its industry more effectively than any other publication in history. Now, as we can see, there is a logical sequence for digital transformation, from digitization to digitalization to digital transformation. And it's really important for you as the leader of the business to understand those differences, to communicate them effectively and chart the progress that you and your teams are making. Words really matter. And it's important to you as a leader who will drive or at least be involved in that digital transformation in your organization to champion the use of the right terms. This is going to ensure everyone is on the right page, truly reaping the rewards of digital transformation. And what are they, might you ask? Well, of course, outside of normal economic performance and competitive advantage, the key to surviving in the current economy is to have business agility. And to have business agility, you really need three components. One is you have to be hyper aware. That is your ability to detect and monitor changes in your external business environment. The second is you need to make informed decision. So you need to have an ability to harness all of that data, turn that into intelligence to inform decision making so that you can make a smart decision fast. And finally, it is that fast execution, that ability to carry out your plans quickly and effectively in order to adapt to the market. So why transform? What do you transform? And how do you transform? These are the words that everybody wants to know. Well, it's really about capitalizing on your risks and your opportunities. Tools like the digitization piano can help to answer the what to transform question. But it is really important to have a clear idea of where transformation is required and in what order it should be tackled. Knowing what to do and how to do it are two very different challenges. So then we come to that third question, how to transform. Of the three questions in the digital business transformation journey, this is the hardest to answer. Indeed, many of the transformation failures mentioned can be put down to flawed execution, the inability to change people around the transformation of the business model or the business process in order to get that performance. The wrong question is, how can we become more digital? because then we just go out and hire all of these people with digital in their job titles, and that just doesn't do the job. So the question is, how do we use digital to improve our services? We can't lose sight of our objectives. To have business survival, we need to have economic performance. We need to become more profitable, and we need to have increased revenues. And we need to get efficiency, so we need to reduce our cost, and we need to get transparency for efficiencies in the value chain. So how do we build our digital strategy is also not the right question, because when we look at the industry's vulnerability to digital disruption, while some industries are difficult to digitize, for example, oil and gas, there are players moving into any industry where value is tapped. I really love David Rogers, and he has five pillars for success in digital transformation. One is customers. Two is competition. Three is our data, four is our innovation, and five is our values. Let me take you on that journey, starting with value. 
Number one, the first thing we all had to do when COVID hit was to adapt our value proposition. We had to redefine who was the desired customer, what was their desired customer experience, what did that look like in terms of product, price, package, transaction, support and access. And then what was it that we were now going to deliver in order to solve that problem and deliver that customer experience? And what was it in this great age of immobility when an American passport is as good as a passport from Botswana in terms of mobility? What is it we can deliver in country now? And what is it that we're going to have to hire partners to deliver? And then finally, what are the programs that we now need to deliver to drive that program on scale? Now, I felt very comfortable as I arrived in my office today because my smart being's woohoo device connected me to my doctor to refill my prescription. It monitored facial recognition to give me entry into the building. It allowed me to go in and out of rooms that would ordinarily have been locked. It ordered my lunch online. It monitored my temperature during the day. It disinfected my desk. And driven by my voice assistant, it read out the calendar appointment for this call and it will tell me my heart rate has gone down post this presentation. Look at that. With this simple smart beings device, all the concepts of market value have completely changed. It delivers these founders steps out of their declining market and it shapes a value proposition. The second thing we need to do is we need to harness our customer networks. And there's no company that has done this better than the Canadian tech accelerator company, Atabotics. How many of you have bought something online this year? This month? This week? Come on, tell the truth, today. How many of you bought something online 10 years ago? The world has completely changed, commerce has changed, and consumer behaviors have absolutely transformed. We used to go to the shopping mall, we used to go to the goods, but now the goods come to us. What we want is what we want, when we want it, and we want it at the lowest price, we want it for convenience, and we want it right now. But guess what? Everything that we want is shipping from far away. You have the power to change retailers' behavior. And we've seen this by the show of hands in the room today. Your influence is extremely strong. And these boxes that move in and out of our supply chain systems that were really made for an old hub and spoke supply chain, the model has changed. That system is a little violent. It's made for grandma's cookies at Christmas. But to survive the system, we have to put everything in a big box think climate change issues. We have to fill it through of air and dunnage to protect it. And then how many people pick up a box that is huge, look inside, find something totally small. Your item has gone through a hub and spoke model that is no longer made for the billions of dollars of e-commerce that are delivered on everyone's doorsteps today. Now, this issue of the box, it has a carbon footprint and it's traveling across the world by air. Think about that box. There is an environmental cost of convenience. But Atabotics is lessening that. And they didn't think like humans. In order to solve their problem, they decided to think like ants. Atabotics developed the world's first 3D robotics fulfillment solution, tailored to modern commerce. Warehousing evolved to meet the expectations of the consumer before the consumer went to the store. And when you're sending goods to a store, a store takes some inventory, the warehouse has some inventory, but the time between them was a week, two weeks. Consumer behavior has flipped that. We now expect huge selection, lowest price, with great convenience. That puts a strain on a supply chain that was developed in a spoken hub model. So we're at this point where we're transitioning. The inspiration for Atabotics was to look at successful natural systems and try to emulate what they do really, really well. The aha moment came that ants, being one of the most successful natural systems on the planet, designed their colonies around a vertical access of goods, not the horizontal access that we use. That led to an innovative geometry, which led to the world's first 3D robotic shuttle, which led to the ability to combine all of the functionality for modern commerce in one ecosystem under one algorithm 
inspired by ants. We're seeing traction in not just retail, but also in pharmaceutical packaging, industrial automation, manufacturing. By moving goods in market, close to the consumer, we could address the warehousing, the pick, pack, and ship costs, take a big chunk out of transportation costs. This is a global problem, and our technology can address this problem anywhere people are buying things. The biggest thing we're building here at Autobotics isn't robots. It's a place we always wished we could work. If we can help retailers, and if we can help consumers, and in doing so, help the planet, there's a real good purpose to automation. Now, every kind of organization, whether small or large, public or private, is finding new ways to operate effectively and to meet the needs of its consumers. We are living in an age of great immobility, and as a result, machine learning technology is playing a massive role in enabling that shift by providing tools to support remote communication, like here today, enable telemedicine, and protect our food security. We should also consider how digital transformation is enabling us to adapt to competition. Because in a friction-free environment, a platform economy, we have to build platforms, not products. I've had so many of my friends being called to fly internationally to see a sick parent terrified that they would not make it in time. And for many of them, they didn't. I too have been an expat for over 13 years. And very sadly, I didn't make it home to my father or my grandmother's last minutes of life either. What if I could have had a technology that told me with great accuracy exactly how much time I had left? I would know whether or not I had time to get on a plane or whether or not I could have stayed on the phone with them right to the very end. Now with Peach and Telehealth in a hospital, the nurses can tell exactly how long my loved ones have left in before there is such a decline in their health status. Machine learning is helping leaders become hyper smart. They have all of that information and are able to make informed decisions in the face of COVID-19. They're able to think smart and act fast. Organizations are also examining ways to limit the spread of COVID-19, particularly among vulnerable populations. And Peach and Telehealth as a platform company is now integrating with other digital health aggregators who are looking at chronic disease to use their expertise in healthcare data to identify those at high risk or severe complications of a number of different disease complications across vulnerable people in our communities as an AI-based predictive modeler that identifies people most at risk of severe complications. And they're doing an outstanding job signing contracts with many other digital health providers in the world as AI on the inside. Now this technology is really proven in clinical studies to provide 24 hour advance notice of patient deterioration and it's actionable in multiple conditions. And this potential for advanced intervention for sepsis patients in particular can translate to 15 to 30% reduction in ICU stays while remote health monitoring can avoid an average cost of $11,000 per preventable readmission. Peach is turning data into oil. These data aggregators, patient data turns into value and data-driven decision-making. Turn your data into assets. You were with me last year, perhaps when we were watching my country burn, Australia, really suffering from the impacts of climate change. And now here we are throwing carrots out of the sky. How do we transform this? Well, meet Aviatech. Aviatech is a Southeast Asian crop intelligence company collecting data from drones flying up to 1300 feet above the sky to help the company spot fires in remote and inaccessible areas. It's helping us to have clean air here in Singapore today. It is part of a technology driven catapulting palm oil industry that is the world's most consumed vegetable oil that has a dependence on manual labor and is becoming one of the fastest growing markets for commercial unmanned aircraft. This drone is enabling our food security and food supply chain. Food processing governance now have the ability to understand the current state of agriculture. They can avoid any unnecessary shocks or disruption to already fragile supply chains. They're offering cutting edge AI driven crop intelligence for retailers to know additional resiliency and certainty to supply chains and to have the technology that looks at that satellite imagery and provides flags to farmers and retailers early on so they can better manage supply, procurement and inventory planning.
This platform deploys custom-based machine learning models that mix all of that imagery from multiple satellites, enabling a near real-time assessment of agricultural conditions. And now they're spraying and reseeding through drone intelligence. So my country that lacks the workforce to replant the thousands and thousands of trees necessary across the country can now utilize drones to do so. This is a task that is high volume, always the same. And you can see here, they're even disinfecting. Another example of a company that is a platform company finding multiple use cases for its technology. So now let's think about how we innovate through rapid experimentation. And I'd like you to meet my co-founder, Daniel. You know, today over 1 billion of the world's population has no food. And with climate change, we are facing the challenge of the 70s. 70% 70 of the world's food grown is grown from the world's 70% poorest people and uses 70% of our available water supplies. And the saddest thing is that 30% of all this food is going to go wasted in our complex global supply chains. Even worse, one in 10 of us is going to get terribly sick and 30% of those are going to be our children under the age of five. Food security and food safety is an incredibly important concern for all of us in a post-COVID, pre-climate change context. Daniel has decided to disrupt the industry. And how does he do that? If you want to disrupt an industry, you need to find two levers for disruption, change the level of information risk and change the alignment of incentives. Now, look how he's doing that. Daniel has completely transforming the fruit supply chain. And now he's using this process of rapid experimentation to not only do it for fruit, but now to also do it for meat and fish. And in fact, today we were just talking to the vineyards in France to now look at wine security in the complex global supply chain. These five strategic themes around customers, competition, data, innovation, and value are the pillars to help you survive, not only thrive in a digital economy. 
taking customers from passive targets to dynamic networks, competition from symmetric to asymmetric, thinking about us all as frenemies on the value chain, moving us from products to platforms. Think about data once siloed, now moving to a strategic asset. And we're innovating from top-down planning to experimentation. Instead of taking massive bets, agile in the ecosystem, testing with customer, getting that feedback loop, failing fast and then scaling up. And then finally, we're getting that value from defending to adaptation. We're finding new concepts of market value, finding paths out of declining markets. And we're really finding those steps to value proposition evolution. All of these skills are fundamental. And I ask you to reflect on your organization. What is the attitude of your board to digital disruption? Do they recognize or respond appropriately? Are they taking a fast follower approach? Or are they actively responding by disrupting their own businesses? The effect of digital technologies and business models on your company's current value proposition and its resulting market position is the most important questioning that you do this year. Digital transformation, remember, it's not about technology. It's all about strategy, it's about leadership, and it's about new ways of thinking. For the first time in history, the entire world has had the opportunity to face the same challenge at exactly the same time. Everything everywhere has changed, but yet this crisis has given us an extraordinary opportunity to stop, think, reflect, and transform together in order to build a better world. All of us everywhere at the same level are having the same conversations. Now with our founders and our decade long commitment to transforming the flows of capital for responsible investment and impact, we at R3i are empowering these conversations and underwriting our founders with breakthrough ideas through venture capital so that together we can take transformative action towards a sustainable pandemic world. Now we encourage you to join us on the journey because only together can we inspire possible. Thank you. Good morning, good evening and good afternoon. I look forward to speaking to you again. My name is Lisa Slood, and I'm the general partner of R3i Ventures. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing your wonderful insights. It's time now to find out how all of that can be put into practice. Up next, we have NetApp's own Mitch Barnes. He's always had a fascination for data, how it is stored, secured, protected, and most importantly, how it can be leveraged as a tool to gain insights and be used to create successful business outcomes. With over a decade of experience across both technical and business disciplines, he's able to utilize his broad capabilities to advise customers on the best solutions tailored specifically to meet their needs. He's passionate about continual improvement and is excited to work in such an amazing and ever-changing industry. He is NetApp's own principal solutions engineer. He's here to show you how to accelerate the digital agenda. Mitch Barnes, over to you. Okay, thanks for having me today. Appreciate everyone's time. Today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, digital resiliency and specifically transformation. The agenda today, really, I wanted to focus on how the industry analysts are seeing the current state within the environment, what our customers are doing and what we're seeing from a customer perspective here at NetApp, and then particularly focus on a story on what we're doing here uh, at NetApp and have done over many years to transform. So how do the industry analysts see it? As you can imagine, um, you know, the last 12 months for, for anyone be it in, in IT or, or business or otherwise, has been challenging. The impact of COVID-19 has been quite profound on the industry and it's, it's resulted in a significant amount of change. Some of which you can see like major Australian brands or companies like Virgin Australia, for example, going into voluntary administration. There's a graph you can see here, it's probably a little hard, but Basically, what this shows is some analysis from a company that tracks uh, flights globally. And in comparison to January um, to October 2019, 
which is the yellow line at the top um, versus 2020 and that same time period, as you can see, flights uh, globally have dropped dramatically. Uh, this has had a major impact on the flight industry, but also too uh, a major impact on, on tourism um, as well as the Australian economy. One particular um, business and I suppose uh, more leisure-based business is Star Casino. So they're located uh, in Sydney, Australia, as well as uh, Brisbane and the Gold Coast. They unfortunately, as part of the COVID impact, had to close their business um, for a period of time. And as a result, unfortunately had to remove 90% um, of their workforce during the COVID or coronavirus pandemic. The music industry has been significantly impacted. Um, you know, you think historically pre-COVID, um, you'd be able to go to a bar or, or a restaurant and um, watch a live show, or maybe, you know, you went to a concert with your friends. Um, since coronavirus hit, some of those changes have been quite dramatic specific to that industry. And one thing that we've seen especially is the impact of uh, overseas students on the higher education sector. Um, not just to higher education itself, but that ecosystem and community that falls around that. Uh, there's quite a few restaurants, bars, um, cafes that rely on that sort of student uh, economy, if you will, um, to support their business. And, and some businesses have either closed or seen up to 70 to 80 percent of revenue loss because simply the students are just not there anymore. And one big thing, I, I was reading a report by Deloitte specifically, um, how COVID is going to rewrite Australia's future. You know, you think of some of the things I've just mentioned now and the economic impact that it's had, especially with global travel, um, we're definitely not seeing the traffic or, or even the migration of people from other countries to become new Australians. So McKinsey and company did a, a study uh, specifically around um, the next normal for the Australian workforce. And as you can see in this table here, um, it covers a, a number of things. So in particular with the COVID-19 uh, restrictions, that has a, a large impact on, on business. A little bit earlier, I was talking about the Star Casino. Um, they're actually interestingly one of my customers here at NetApp. And yeah, they've had some sort of major changes they've had to implement for their business to support the new COVID-19 restrictions. But then also too, is the business cycle effects. So in relation to wages, um, products that are exported outside of Australia or, or imported um, and overall business health. Um, particularly an example is around, you know, new entrants to the business market within this COVID period or business failures, unfortunately. One thing we're seeing as well, based on, on a lot of data is the impact or what the market's going to look like post COVID or getting back to business, so we say. As you can see in this uh, slide here, it shows various different sectors and amount of change required, which you can see by the purple line at the bottom there to continue business as they are. And then the gray line outlines whether they're most likely to change soon or least likely to change soon. As you can see on the left uh, under the green circle there, banking and finance, telco, public transport, government services, supermarkets, and so forth, are most likely soon to change and their rate of change required to continue business is low. If you look at supermarkets, for example, they're considered uh, essential services. Uh, so some of their uh, operations have been prioritized like shipping and transporting uh, goods between their distribution centers and stores. Um, but if you look at the other end of the spectrum in relation to hospitality, retail, 
and in some cases higher education, they're least likely soon to make a change, but the amount of change required is high. You know, if you think of a traditional bricks and mortar retail store, um, they generally rely on customers to go to their store to purchase their products, um, you know, or maybe find out about new products that they've brought to market. A dramatic am amount of change is required in some of those more traditional industries to move from a traditional bricks and mortar business to running an online business, for example. So what are customers doing? What are we seeing here at NetApp? I've broken this down into several sectors and we'll outline specifically what some uh, businesses are doing uh, based on what we've seen and the solutions we've helped them with. Traditionally in the government space, um, government agencies um, or departments of the Commonwealth, we've seen that they traditionally owned their own infrastructure. Um, they, were, they were operated by the department or agency and they were within their own data center. Um, a number of years ago at AWS Public Sector Summit in Canberra, um, Alastair McGibbon, he was the cybersecurity advisor to parliament and the prime minister at the time. He gave an address that outlined cloud is inherently more secure than on-prem. My sort of take on that is that because cloud has a shared responsibility model, uh, it definitely can be more secure provided it's architected and set up in the right way. So one thing we're seeing is that a change in, in government specifically is that move to consumption-based models. Uh, NetApp interestingly has set up infrastructure uh, and services that run out of GovDC, which is uh, two government specific data centers in Unundera and Silverwater within Australia in New South Wales. And we provide secured services to government customers. We actually have a number of agencies that are running on that infrastructure today uh, and have transitioned to paying based on a consumption model. So instead of buying infrastructure up front um, with a large capex cost, what they're actually doing is spreading those costs out and paying for resources as they need them. This in turn has provided uh, a lot of flexibility and the ability when it comes to them being able to use that CapEx funds that they would have spent traditionally in big one lump sum to spread those costs out. But then also too, it gives them the capability to transfer money into other budgets to focus on other projects. From a construction perspective, we've seen a number of changes uh, in this industry. Traditionally, um, m most construction businesses provided remote desktop services to their end users or alternatively um, on-premise environments. You know, if you think of construction, there's many different roles within that vertical or within that market itself. But primarily what we're seeing is in the construction industry, companies moving towards using the cloud, uh, the cloud for various things like in one case, uh, Azure Windows Virtual Desktops with GPU integrated virtual machines. And that's specific to a designer or engineer uh, within the construction industry. Typically they've got um, high compute and graphic workloads. Uh, think of computer assisted design programs that they can design buildings with and so forth, being able to access um, those sort of resources from home usually wasn't available. So by being able to, this company in particular that we worked with, by being able to provide that experience to their end users from the cloud, when the COVID restrictions were implemented and their users had to work from home, they were able to use some solutions delivered by NetApp in conjunction with Azure and a particular Microsoft product called Azure NetApp Files to store their user profiles and user data in the cloud. Another thing we've seen uh, specific to the construction industry is that 
customers using cloud to accelerate the way they do business today. Uh, one in particular is, is one of my customers, Lendlease. Um, you know, there's a lot of press on them. They're currently working with uh, Google Cloud where they've been able to build a platform from scratch in the cloud, um, very microservices like architecture. And it's definitely something that I'd suggest you go and have a look at specifically if you're in the construction industry. From an energy perspective, in terms of transformation, we've actually seen a number of emerging trends. One of the challenges we see with utilities in Australia is that Australia is a very dispersed and large environment. And, you know, you could walk out to the street side and see a number of power poles, lines, um, but what's typically on those street curbs or sort of council lots, if you will, is trees and things like that. We had a particular customer where they had issues with maintaining supply of services um, and interference where vegetation grows around their lines uh, and poles specifically. And what that resulted in is that they had a mobile um, workforce that was scheduled manually to go and check particular areas and then do the necessary works to maintain the poles and wires, but then also to, to trim the vegetation. The net result with, with that was that they had um, a number of expenses that were involved with maintaining that workforce and them going out to streets manually. Not only that, it was very time consuming. So in combination with utilizing artificial intelligence um, and then various other technologies like helicopter mounted LIDAR systems, they were able to understand the climate and types of vegetation that lived and grew around their poles and wires that allowed them to provide services to their customers. And then by using analytics and artificial intelligence, they were able to understand that based on a particular climate and maybe particular humidity uh, and a particular uh, vegetation type. So say for example, uh, a gum tree, how much that would grow and at what rate and when that was going to impact uh, one of their poles or wires uh, within a particular suburb. And from that, instead of sending people manually on a scheduled route, they were able to send their workforce out to trim trees um, and vines and things like that um, in a more efficient way. So by, by being able to make use of artificial intelligence, uh, analytics and some specific technologies within the cloud, they were able to reduce their costs of maintaining their infrastructure um, that provides their services to their customers. Um, and not only that, they were able to provide uh, a more resilient service to their customers as well. I think retail's definitely seen a large amount of change during the last 12 to 24 months. And I also think that COVID has had a large impact in accelerating retail businesses change uh, within that period. We've seen many retailers move um, from traditional systems to becoming fully digital. Um, many of them have gone on a cloud transformation journey, in particular using a multi-cloud architecture approach. And this makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons. Um, if you think of, um, say for example, platform as a service, like um, Azure, within Azure, um, there's a .NET as a service and that particular retailer is using a .NET application or a service that they've written in .NET. It makes a lot more sense to them to run that on a platform as a service offering instead of spending the time to maintain the platform themselves. And this allows them to innovate uh, and bring new features to the market a lot faster. 
Another thing we've seen as well is that, you know, if you think of a traditional retailer, they either make their own stock or they buy stock from a wholesaler and they need to store that stock in a warehouse and then that needs to be sent out to their stores or their customers. Uh, one big challenge can be that if there is an event, uh, like a failure event within one of their distribution centers, that can impact their whole, su so their whole supply chain, but then also too, their inventory levels in stores, customer experience, etc. So one thing we've seen in the retail space or more so logistics and warehousing space is that customers moving towards more automated systems um, and those automated systems can allow them to do things like failover services to the cloud in the event that they have a failure of their on-premises equipment within a distribution center. But then um, another trend we're kind of seeing as well focused around retail is that customer experience. So if you think of, uh, you know, a traditional supermarket that you go into today, you have to walk down the aisles and choose your particular uh, products that you wish to buy, uh, go to a cash register, someone scans all those products for you, um, and then you've got to pay. That's quite a time consuming um, process to say the least. Um, definitely some retailers have moved towards delivery or click and collect, especially with these latest COVID restrictions. But again, that's still a challenge. So one thing we're seeing is uh, a lot of utilization or research into the utilization of um, analytics, um, deep facial recognition, deep learning, and things specifically around IoT and edge-based sensory. So if you think of a more transformative um, retail store, maybe you could look at the Amazon um, sort of food, food related retail outlets that they're starting to bring to market. On their shelves or within their stock that's within the store, they're using a smart inventory system. So, you know, when a customer enters the store, maybe they scan a QR code or they scan a, a membership card that recognizes who the customer is. Um, then the customer will go throughout the store and pick their products. And then automatically throughout that journey that they have, it will add and or remove um, those products from their shopping cart, if you will, or their virtual shopping cart. And once they've completed their uh, shopping experience, they can leave the store and it'll automatically get charged to their account. One of the big key components there is, is the data and having the speed to be able to move the data quickly between the sensors and devices that are capturing that information and then correlate them with systems like user database, um, you know, user records, user account, etc. So that's one thing we're seeing a lot of um, change in that industry, retail specific, and how companies are able to measure that customer experience and provide uh, a new world customer experience, and that's changing every day. Another thing we're seeing specific to the higher education um, vertical or market is the shift towards remote working. So. As I mentioned a lot earlier in the presentation, there's been a large economic impact to the um, tourism and aerospace industry, um, as well as students coming to Australia for uh, study, specifically in uh, places like universities. Because this has had a large impact and the amount of students within a campus are, are typically dramatically reduced. Universities have had to move towards looking for online options or being able to provide learning um, and curricular study to students um, in a virtual way. So one particular university that we have as a customer, um, they've implemented a HCI solution and initially that was to support their faculty staff. So the staff that actually work with the students, um, lecturers, 
researchers and so forth that provide um, learning services to the students. But with that technology in place, um, and that's particularly NetApp HCI or hyperconverged infrastructure, they were able to scale it out very, very quickly and respond to the impact of COVID by providing remote or virtual desktop services to students as well. We've seen um, another university as well leverage the Google Cloud platform for online learning and content delivery specifically. Um, also by leveraging NetApp technology that sits behind that to assist them to easily move uh, content between their on-premises uh, data center and infrastructure to the cloud quite easily. So in the next section, I'm gonna to talk to you about what NetApp is doing around digital transformation, um, specifically to our own environment. NetApp, like any other, is, is a software business that has a number of uh, engineers, developers, um, you know, product management, so on and so forth, that develop the products we bring to market. They need an environment much like yours to be able to bring these products to market and so forth. So we've been doing quite a lot over the last couple of years specific to this. First, we focused on um, transformation. So, you know, you think of low hanging fruit, if you will, being able to transform our on-prem solutions to things that we can let someone else look after for us. So if you think about that, you think of an ERP or financial system, um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to run those type of things, uh, email, for example, internally. So to simplify business process, uh, especially we move some of those services to the cloud. You know, you think of email in, and, and the ecosystem of sort of Microsoft products to Office 365, ERP to SAP, um, some database services to Oracle Cloud and ServiceNow and so forth. But I think the, the big, um, challenge was to transform the way we actually ran as a business. And I'll go into this in a lot more detail in some following slides, but um, how do we differentiate from our competitors um, and gain competitive ad advantage, as well as focus on what we can deliver to our customers through uh, rapid software changes. So by being able to use the services that are available, either by creating our own private cloud environment within our own data centers uh, or public cloud environments specific to AWS, Azure and Google, we were able to do that. We called this um, project or, or ongoing project Cloud One and Customer One. So Cloud One had specific goals and they were largely focused around increasing the speed of application change and delivery, to, especially to meet the rapid and changing needs of not only NetApp's business, but customers' businesses. Um, you know, you think of a developer um, and the process that they go through to begin working and start cutting code for a particular service platform or, or software that they're working on. They've got to have an environment that's ready and working for them with all the necessary tools um, and services available so that they can focus on particularly one thing and that's writing good quality code and releasing application uh, changes at scale and also speed. So one of the focuses was on developer efficiency specifically um, and not having to deal with things around them like IT services that might get in the way. Um, but then also too, being able to provide automation for frequent small production changes. So instead of uh, a traditional monolithic uh, application, which uh, some of our services were, one of the goals was to move towards a more microservices architecture so that changes could be rolled out on a really frequent, frequent basis but then also to allow developers to test and try new things and fail fast, if and when needed. But then also to 
one of the major focuses or goals was specific to reducing cost. And I'll cover that in a little bit more detail in a minute. So as you can see here, Cloud One, this is a platform that we built um, for customer one, and that's NetApp IT. And that, that team runs all of NetApp's internal infrastructure. Um, we've been using NetApp technology internally um, for many, many, many years. And really based on some of those tenants and goals that I talked about earlier, it was the capability to provide a consistent user experience, really irrespective of where the destination was. So, you know, we've got a number of developers uh, and teams that look after different services and products, uh, and they all have their own requirements. But being able to deliver a private cloud um, or a public cloud through that one sort of lens or that sort of one-stop shop for a developer and business users made so much sense. And the only way we were able to do that is by utilizing NetApp technologies and in particular, building our own data fabric to support that. So for example, workloads could run within our private cloud um, but then also too, maybe a developer would want to utilize some resources within Google Cloud and potentially something as platform as service on Azure. They were able to do that very easily. And I'll talk about the how in a little minute. But some of the challenges we kind of saw, and, and as I mentioned, this has been a quite a long journey for NetApp. We've done this over six years. Uh, you know, if you look at the points on the left there, before we did spend a lot of time as a traditional IT team being very reactionary and fighting fires. You know, maybe someone wanted to check out some code and, and make some changes, but there was an issue during that process or it took too long for them. Um, one thing specifically around um, change management and also to uh, orders. So, you know, if a customer had a customized solution and or there was a specific feature we were trying to release for a particular use case, there was challenges in doing that. And as a result, um, we saw a lot of shadow IT, which most organizations um, either have under control by now, which is fantastic, uh, or alternatively, they don't. And typically, we see shadow IT occur when people get frustrated with internal IT not being able to provide services at the speed and scale that the business is moving. The after is what's really interesting. So if you have a look on the right, you can see a graph that shows the six year trend for NetApp IT services. And in FY12, you can see that IT spending was quite high, which is the green dotted arrow there. The change volume was quite low, which is interesting, but the number of P1 incidents were very high. So from a developer perspective or a user of those IT services, things were not ideal. And as you can imagine, if the rate of change or the change volume, say for example, to code and features is very low, um, and there's a number of issues, people are going to get frustrated with those services um, that IT was providing to the business. So by being able to make very specific changes that focused on our cloud first strategy, we were able to not only increase the change volume by 30, 36%, which is fantastic. Um, that basically means the quicker we can build features, the quicker we can build uh, bring them to market and have customers test and use and enjoy those. Um, but also we've seen the number of incidents drop dramatically by 90% and also IT spend uh, drop by 55%. But I think the biggest thing is the time to recover. So in the event that there was an issue, <clears throat> we went from a recovery time of 246 minutes down to less than 99 minutes. Now, all this might seem like, uh, you know, numbers on a chart, but if you think about it, with in business or internal IT, the one constant thing that, that I see especially, and we've seen as a business is that 
there's two or three things that don't change. And that is the budget that IT gets to operate within, the headcount um, that IT gets to perform the tasks that they need to. Uh, and then also typically the third is the increase in the amount of priorities that IT have. Um, so without these, with, without these three things changing, what can you do or what can your business do to transform and become more efficient? And that's what we needed to do as a uh, IT organization to support our business. So by being able to leverage the power of cloud uh, and services that live within either the NetApp ecosystem um, or that we've built ourselves, we were able to greatly improve developer efficiency. And you might say, well, what does a developer efficiency mean? Or how does that work? Typically, um, or historically, we had uh, a very large, extremely large monolithic code base, and some very large monolithic applications. And one of the challenges with that was that you know, if you think of your traditional um, sort of waterfall development methodology, changes take uh, a lot of time, a lot of testing. And if an environment that a developer needs to work within is extremely large, it may take quite a long time for them to have an environment prepared and ready for them to begin work. Now, if an environment took an hour to be prepared for a developer to start writing or cutting code, that's an hour of productivity lost every day. Uh, but then if changes need to occur, um, the result gets amplified dramatically. So we were able to build a service catalog of services for developers and testers, and they were able to consume them in a really neat and easy way. So say, for example, you know, you think of the workflow or a day in the life of a developer, they were able to use a self-service uh, portal and then maybe one of their requirements would be an environment within a particular uh, cloud. They were able to request that and select a specific um, number of requirements based on their selection through a service catalog. And in the background, an automated workflow would occur. And then finally, provision an environment for them and give them the ability to access that very easily. So there's a number of steps in this process, but essentially what we did by the utilization of some NetApp technology to allow the data to be moved in and out of or cloned or um, sort of backed up and reverted to uh, within those environments and using a number of automation technologies, we we're able to provide a really seamless uh, and service centric experience to our developer workforce, which obviously had a large impact. I think <clears throat> just as a parting note, some key takeaways, as I mentioned before, COVID-19 has had a really big uh, impact on industry in general. And one of the most interesting or in, in, in my opinion, exciting things is the dramatic um, transformation it's had in relation to customers themselves having to transform. Um, some businesses have coped really, really well with this. Um, others have not, but definitely with the way um, people or, or a workforce is having to work today, uh, and the services available, it makes a lot of sense to really sit back and look at your digital transformation journey, strategy, roadmap, and what you're considering. And there's been a number of businesses that have had successful transformation projects, which have provided them a competitive advantage in the market. By using some of the technologies that we did at NetApp here, uh, we've been able to bring features to market quicker for customers and innovate, providing them the ability to move data no matter where their workload sits, be it on-prem or in the cloud. And really, you can too. So to learn more about 
how NetApps transforms specifically, have a look at our uh, website there. You can see netappit.com or also to check out cloud.netapp.com. Uh, there's a lot of use cases and industry specific information there that I think you'd find really handy. And as always, uh, Net at NetApp, we do unlock the best of cloud. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mitch, for the deep dive. No doubt a few learnings there for everyone on how to accelerate your own digital agenda. Like Mitch, no one knows how to elevate your cloud experience like NetApp, private, hybrid, or public. After all, we've been busy redefining the data landscape since 1992. We're the only people who make all that innovation available to you in your data centers and in the world's biggest clouds. Thank you for attending this webinar. If you'd like to learn more, as Mitch alluded, head to netappit.com now to get the full story.